Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Part of being a high-performance team, there's going to be bumps and knocks and missing the ball and missing the goal or doing a bad pass or doing something. But it's about moving on and improving and re-cohesing into that team. You know, when you're on the field, in that time, like in business, you've got to bring the best game. Halfway through, you can't stop and start blaming and naming and shaming. You can, but there's a consequence of smashing performance by doing that. And that's what leaders and managers are missing today is they need to become coaches and not the manager that's doing a performance duration on on the process hi there innovator it's great to be back with you and with another episode of the innova buzz podcast i hope you've had an awesome week so far and i hope you enjoyed my recent conversations with odette barry of odette and co and with michael van the co-author of buying out the boss. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Tony DeVale. He's the founder and CEO of Life Masters. He's also known as a business soul surgeon. Tony helps people and companies to achieve exponential impacts and results in a human positive manner that supports people, the planet and profits. His personal transformation and team performance techniques activate and align the best and fullest potential in people, in teams, in leadership and in culture. He fuses real-life experiences, neuroscience and powerful stories together to take you and your people, teams and conscious leadership to the next level of potential and possibility in both your life and your business. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, that's InnovaBiz, where we help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience and connect with their ideal client. That requires absolute clarity about who your ideal clients are and how you can help them. To help you get that clarity about your ideal client, take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class, where... In less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity on your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. Access the Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. In our discussion today, Tony talked to me about his change facilitation process and how to develop learnings in a psychologically safe environment. He described how he goes about building feedback and accountability into teams and he also described how he builds emotional connections to strengthen relationships. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Tony DeVale. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today, all the way from Johannesburg in South Africa, Tony DeVale, who's the founder of Life Masters and the author of the book Swift Success. Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, Tony. It's a real privilege to have you as my guest. Good morning, Jürgen. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Now, Tony, you say you help people and companies achieve exponential impacts through human positive results and results that support people, the planet and profits. So I'm really keen to dig into that some more. Now, I had a look through your background and you know, you've had a very interesting upbringing. You've had a kind of an interesting 
bunch of lessons through school where you were very competitive playing hockey, you were in the defence force, you were you also played tennis, squash and cricket, you studied computer program and you were in the Boy Scout movement and did a lot there around leadership, entrepreneurial focus and self-mastery, team building and so on. So give us a bit of a snapshot of how a lot of these experiences that you've had in your life shape what you do today. Okay, good morning. Thank you. Yeah, I think the real value of, of life is life is like a gym. We come into this gym with the opportunity of choosing what equipment we're going to use to build what part of our bodies. But for me, what I've discovered is the building that I needed to do and was blessed is not much. At the, I didn't like it at the time. You know, it's like when you're in the gym, <laughs> when you're in the gym and you're really pushing hard and you, the muscles are burning. It hurts like, a bit. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's benefit later. But but for me, the growth was in my thinking process and managing how I feel because I was put in a context in an environment where I had to constantly reassess: Am I okay? Am I doing good? Because my environment was giving me negative feedback from per- parental input. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. So I had to find some kind of anchor point to say, but you actually are doing quite good. And so for me, that became the journey of learning how to manage this machine, this brain. Uh, I studied NLP, hypnotherapy, timeline therapy, any of the technologies that help you grow your thinking, feeling, and action. And for me, that was the important part is I had to learn how to overcome my habitual program thought viruses and manage this internal weather system because whether you feel good or don't feel good isn't about what's happening outside. It's what's happening inside. Whether you take Mm. action or don't take action is what's happening inside, not outside. So many people know what to do they don't do what they know because they don't feel like it. And that's the shift that I have in the work that I do is, is bringing out the best in the people. You know, Gallup's research shows that less than 15, 20% of people are engaged. If you just double that in an organization, productivity and the performance is absolutely outstanding with what you can achieve. So that's been my focus is teaching people how to do what I've learned how to do. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just going to ask that. So you've learned how to do that um, because you had some doubts about your own self-worth or self, you know, not being good enough. And yet I see that um, a lot of the things that you've been involved in, you only play to win. Um, But then how did you get, how did you take that next step of saying, well, I've, I've discovered this, this has really helped me. Now I can go out and help other people make this transformation? I think I had to get gutful. I don't know if you understand the word, but gutful is I had to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I had studied (laughs) technology. I had done computer programming. I had worked with IBM, had my own business, long hours, money flow both in and out, in and out, not making millions, often often making and then losing and making and losing. And I got to the point where I said to myself, what is really important? What is meaningful? What do I really want from my life? Because I was running a business because that was the freedom. I'm, my number one value is freedom. So being an entrepreneur was my choice. But it's almost like your parents say you should become a doctor, so you become a doctor against your real passion. And that's what happened to me is I, I was in my computer company. We had 45 staff. My partner and I had a conversation and I said, I'm really, I'm not happy. I'm not doing what I love. Fighting fires the whole time, working 18 to 20 hours a day, seven days a week. This is not what I imagined my life to be. The money is, yes, money is important, but it's not the core. I was unhappy here. And I literally Mm. went to him and I said, I love you madly, but you know what? Give me half the money in the bank. Give me some technology and I'm out of here, but I, I need a different life. So... We parted. How long? How long ago was this? Probably thirty years ago plus. Yeah, yeah. So it it was a big jump. It was a leap of faith. Mm. But the pain was big enough. I always say, you know, when the pain's big enough, you'll make the decision. So we we one oh one oh one oh one to one to, and then one day when it's like it's like a. 
when I'm doing my Krav Maga training, you know, you can bend an arm or a hand to a point where you can tolerate it. And most that's the thing. Most people are tolerating a second-class life. They hate the work they do. They hate the people they're working with. They hate the boss and, and all of the things. They don't love what they do. And so you can tolerate this pain to a point, but there comes a line of like, no, I'm out. And I got to that mm. point. And then I had to like step back and say, right, now with what I like and what I can do, what do I want to do? it? And I've been blessed because I was doing the rebuilding of me and I'd done all the studies on, on improving myself and self-mastery. I thought I'd really love to do this and help other people and, and grow myself and then share that wisdom into the organizations. Because te technology is one thing, but what technology are we developing for people to optimize people's performance and people's potential? Mm. And so that became my, I took my technological capacity in COBOL and programming and computers, and I applied that to the human element. So now, now I hack human software. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love that. Love that analogy. And in some way, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because we kind of think of the brain as just some mushy organ that sits inside our head, but it's actually a pretty sophisticated, uh, probably the most sophisticated computer that we can imagine at the moment. If you consider your consciousness as being a centimeter in size, in, in power, your unconscious brain, in comparison to that one centimeter, your unconscious brain's power relative to that is about 11 kilometers. Hmm. Think about that. Here's your yeah. unconscious brain, 11 kilometers. Here's your conscious brain, one, one centimeter. One centimeter. And so we, we are driven... We are driven by stuff we don't even understand. Your brain, your internal brain makes decisions up to seven seconds before you're aware of the choice being made by your brain. That's scary. But it happens. Mm. That's how the brain works. Yeah, that's scary. But it's also um, when you understand that and you start to learn how to tap into that, that's yes. quite magical. And I'm guessing that that's what the basis of some of your systems are when you talk about hacking yeah. the human brain absolutely mm. it's so, a biological computer that you need to to manage and have antivirus and put the right programs into <laughs> yeah antivirus software yeah i'm the antivirus right. well, yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that, that might be uh topical right now because um, we're in the midst of the covid19 yeah. situation but yeah anyway the on the mind thing so a lot of your work involves working with teams and getting them to a point where you optimize their performance, but what you talk about is really getting them to a really high performing team and a high performing system. So talk us through a little bit about some of the things you do there, what kind of framework you put in place and, and how you, how you tap into that 11 kilometers of uh, <laughs> unconsciousness. <laughs> so, God gave me a good brain. I learned fairly rapidly, and I'm able to assimilate and, and create a recipe from what I'm, I'm learning. And I had a look at all of the world's research around people, teams, leadership, culture. Where is the lever that you turn to improve performance? So as a manager or a leader, there are a million things you can do, but they're not always going to improve performance in, in a sustainable, humane way. And I found an environment with a, a professor, Andre Duval, from the High Performance Center in Holland. And they had academically validated systems and frameworks and meta-research that showed the five areas that you need to address to improve organizational performance uh, on a long-term basis. And I took, because of my, the way my brain operates, I'm just an optimizing system. Everything I look at is how do we improve? How do we improve? How do we, how do we save, speed up, improve? And I took his framework as part of the process, and I took all of my research and experience because I've been doing human performance optimization from my Boy Scout days. And I then mapped over his work with my reference points and the work that I've been doing, and I found it was a fairly good match in the process. For me, I've come to realize that the foundation of everything is people. You can have the best technology in the world and everything, but the, the building bricks of your organization, like the bricks behind you, are individual people. So happy, healthy, high-performance people can be put together to make a better team. From my, my, my hockey days, when I played very seriously, one guy, one bad guy in a team can smash the performance of, an, of a team completely. So the right mindsets, right skill sets of the people then enable you to build a good team. 
But even with a good team, people talk about these self-managing teams. They're not easy to have unless everybody's a self-managing leader. And that's very often in, in our part of the world, most people are followers. They don't want to put their hand up and be the leader. So yeah. then leadership became the next lever. So it's people, teams, leadership and improving the leadership, self-leadership, and then team leadership and understanding how to get the best of people. You know, we, we have a, a melting pot of, of race, of religion, of culture. So it's not just you've got all your buddies that you can talk to and you understand their cultural view, viewpoint. You've got six, seven, eight different cultures, sexes, races. So you, as a leader, you've got to be really astute and aware and sensitive to the dynamics of the process. And people times teams times leadership will create the culture. Culture is a consequence, but once it's created, it becomes a cause and a consequence, and it becomes a, a self-feeding loop. And so if you're going to improve culture, you have to start with people, mindset, attitude, beliefs, values, behaviors. I might have all the, all the potential in the world, but if I don't believe it, I can't use it. And so learned helplessness is the number one constraint I see in our country, is people have this huge power like the elephant at the circus, but they believe that they can't, so they don't. And so to build a mm. team, a high-performance team with learned helplessness still active is a problem. And so my process is first level is mindset, shifting the internal identity of who I am, what belief systems I have about my capacity, capability, and how I can show up in the world. So I, I do what I call internal re-engineering or soul, I call it corporate soul surgery, but it's a complete re-engineering of how you show up inside and addressing that unconscious stuff. You know, so many people, so many, when I do, a, in my workshop, we give, we actually give people a bag and in that bag, they put their baggage. So I give them pieces of wood and it's anger, frustration, twitchy, bitchy, whingy, whiny, betrayed or hurt. And they carry the <laughs> yeah. bag for the day. And the activities we do, the lunch, they go to the loo. But eventually they get to a point of like, this bag is getting in the way. And it's like, you're right. Your baggage, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> your baggage, all of your stuff from your life gets in the way. So let's get rid of it. And then we have a process to unhook that baggage. Mm. And then we give them tools that they can stay clear from a point of view of stuff's always going to happen. Somebody's going to press your button. Whether you react and explode and get angry is up to you. And then and I, I play the game with them and I say, you know, who's been angry recently? And so half the room puts up their hand. And I say, okay, on that piece of paper in front of you, write down who made you angry. And so they write some person or a taxi or their mom or their boss. And I say, have a look at that and now answer this question. Is it true that they are in charge of you? Yeah. And they can make you angry or are you in charge of you and you make yourself angry with their stimulus? And it's like, who? Oh, okay. Wow. That's big, isn't it? When you realize that you're in control of your response. So no matter what happens to you, you're, it's you that's actually doing the response. I am the wizard. I am the, the yeah. I can either make it positive or negative, but I am the wizard that controls what happens here and here. And that's the hmm. shift of taking response what I call response ability or response agility, that instead of being reactive the whole time, when stuff comes at me, I can filter it and say, okay, hold on a second. What's coming isn't, isn't for my highest good. And if you want to give me the gift, I'll give it back to you. Thank you. But I'm maintaining my, my, my balance and my stasis in myself. So that's the first part of the process is awareness. With awareness, mm -hmm. you, have, you have better choice. Yeah. And, and some of that baggage, I, you know, going back to our, very early discussion where you talked about your upbringing and uh, the environment you were in and um, feeling that you weren't good enough and that you always had to prove yourself. So I think that's a fairly common thing that a lot of people carry with them, you know, having self-doubt and, and then second guessing themselves and then not playing to their full potential. The first war you have to win is the war inside here, the voices inside here. All of us have yeah. one or two, um, and it's a, <laughs> do I have a voice? Um, yeah. If you've got five, six, or seven, we've got some chemicals to stop those voices. Yeah, yeah. But we all have that internal detractor that holds us back, and some are very ugly. And mine used to be very destructive. So mm -hmm. it, took, it took me a while to learn how to manage it and rewire that component in the process. And every now and again, it's what I call a thought virus. 
every now and again a, a thought will come in and it's like whoa stop where is this from because what people don't understand is you can be thought by a thought that is not yours do you understand that mm-hmm. you can have a okay. thought tell me more about that one it's not sourced through your own thinking process so we are like radiators or like a radio broadcast station. Mm. Have you ever have you ever sat and you suddenly think, I should phone my friend? And you phone yeah. them and they say, Well, I was just thinking of you a minute ago. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So so we are plugged into different frequencies. Same as the radio, or is the radio, you can tune a radio right now in this room to 702 or high belt, or you can tune the radio to a different station. Our thinking can be the same. So if you're tuning and allowing negativity to, to be the dominant frequency in your system, you will resonate and pick up other negativity or other thoughts. So I was driving down the road one day and I was going to go and look at a property that I was buying on the river. And as I got into the highway, a really bad negative feeling came over me. And I thought to myself, stop, stop, stop. Because I'm now aware of what's happening and what I should be feeling versus suddenly having this thought. And it was quite amazing how this this really ugly thought slipped in, and I had to say, okay, cancel. Here's what I'm choosing. Here's my focus. I choose I choose peace, love, abundance, meaning, peace, joy, whatever it is. So, and that's why I would say you need a you need an antivirus. We have probably fifty, sixty thousand thoughts a day, of which ninety five percent are the same baggage you had yesterday. Very few of us have have new, ongoing, created thoughts. We're reacting to an internal noise that's from that 11 kilometers of unconscious. That's right, yeah. Versus yeah, unconscious. Yeah. Here's my focus. Here's my feeling. Here's what I'm going to think, feel, and act today. Hmm. And, and yeah, that, that unconscious is serving up things all the time. And it's a lot of the things are served up when, when it's time. And so being able to deal with it, I think, is is really good. But you you bring up an interesting point there in terms of focus. Um, and it's the old story of if, let's say, you go out to buy a car, you buy a, a, a red VW, and or, or, or you're looking at a red VW because you like it. So you start doing some research. All of a sudden, you see all these red VWs on the road because you've activated your reticular activation system and you're paying attention to that. So whereas before your conscious mind was filtering all that out, the the unconscious, the 11 kilometers that you mentioned earlier was uh, paying attention to that, but it was actually filtering it out because the, the one centimeter of conscious mind wasn't capable of dealing with that information on top of all the other information it's got to try and process. Um, but now, now you focus on that, all of a sudden you start noticing it. And it's... That's, I think that's what happens when you focus on positive rather than negative, as, as you said. You know, as we live, we, are having, we have probably trillions of bits of information coming at us per second. Consciously, you can, you can filter about seven to ten bits of information per second out of trillions. Mm. Which are you focusing on? Is it the positive, yeah. good, great, amazing stuff? Or is it the ugly, yucky, dangerous, threatening stuff? The challenge we have is your brain is hardwired three times more focus on danger than on positivity. So if you look at David Rock's work, all of the, the Lasada, Professor Lasada's work, it takes three positives to balance out one negative, but the dominant focus on the brain is scanning for danger unless you refilter and rewire that particular activation system to look for something constructive. And that's why doing the visualization, um, doing your vision board, it starts to put the stuff in your retic, your RAS, as we call it, and that, that's when the brain starts to filter those billions of information per second. It's so looking for that possibility and that opportunity. But few people use the tool. It's, it's not a rocket science tool to use. Hmm. So coming back to the the work you do with teams, you, you've talked us through like a lot of things, a lot of changes, transformations that you work with individuals on and getting rid of some of the baggage and getting them to focus on different things. So how do you pull that together with teams and, and getting people to work together better 
because coming back to what, we, what we've just been talking about, you know, the, you said seven seven bits of information is per second is mm. what we can actually pay attention to, and sometimes it's less, and sometimes it's a bit more. But the likelihood out of that billions of uh, bits of information that the, you and I see the same seven bits and have have a conversation over here's what I reckon is happening and here's what you think is happening is very small. And so how do you reconcile all that and get people working better together and optimizing team performance? So for me, step one is we would do an assessment, which is part of my revolutionary workplace framework, the, the ClearX assessment. So it's an anonymous assessment. Everybody fills in 60 questions for the six areas of the, the framework, the high performance framework. We start to get to, to see the world through their eyes ind individually, and we consolidate that and anonymize it and then present it to the people. So they get a bird's eye view of how their Ferrari is performing. They have a very good idea from their point of view, but then they start mm. to get the point of view of, of other people. It's like, wow, some are like me, but some are completely different to me. But the precursor to that is that I've managed to sort out their internal static. Very hard. Yeah when you twitchy bitchy winji whiny to forgive another person for the fact that they might have let you down in a job that didn't deliver by four o'clock. So step one is get neutral in yourself. Step two is rebuild that relationship constructively, in, intentionally create a reset in the relationship in the room. Have you ever been let down by people? Yes. Have you let people down? Yes. Are you willing to start again? Are you willing to forgive them for what they did? They were doing the best they could with what they had, but are you willing to let them go so that you can also be given the freedom to start again? And it's a yes. So everybody stands up and yes, I'm sorry. I apologize. Please forgive me. I will do my best. And will you help me bring out my best? So it's a contract but it's a contract in a neutral safe space, which we create with the process with the reference to that's where we are. We then use appreciative inquiry. I don't know if you know appreciative inquiry, focus on the positive, build on the strength. So it's a, it's a positive framework. We focus on what we want more of as opposed to what we want less of. So the shift, for example, in the airlines would be, what does a great experience look like coming through our airport versus how do we stop theft? Or in a workplace, mm -hmm. what does a great workplace relationship look like as a, how do we stop sexual harassment? So we come from the positive frame of reference versus the negative. The next step is tell me about a time when you're part of a great team or in a great organization, or tell me about a positive past experience. Because if we've done it before, we can do it again. We just have to work out how we do it together again. And so all of that information is put into a process. We do a visualization. Dream for me what you would love your company to look like in a year's time. If all of these great, wonderful things happened, what would you love your workplace to look like? It's positive, passionate, and profitable. And so we do a visualization. We come back, and now we start to share that information. I saw this. I saw lovely paintings. I saw lovely trees. I, I saw us in offices where we're working together. I saw us with this. So everybody starts to share their viewpoint in a safe, neutral space. And out of that, the teams then collaborate and say, that resonates with me. That resonates with me. Let's choose three or four things in our appreciative process, and let's do a stop, start, continue to achieve that. We're stopping the following, we're starting the following, and we'll continue the following. So we've taken this positive past experience into a dream, and now we bring into tangibility and reality where there's behavioral action to go and make it happen. And so it's, all right, I will choose to be the leader of that process if that's the level of output that they want. But it's, it's mm -hmm. relationship first, that trust. We have a scale on the wall. Trust is the glue, that, and it's a tax that you pay emotionally, energetically, and financially. Lack of trust can cut your performance potentially in half. And in, especially in our environments where we have this huge cultural dynamic of black versus white and Indian and colored, um, I have people starting trust at zero one out of 10, two out of 10, three out of 10, and we're able to grow that. But it's very hard to, to accelerate trust to 10 out of 10 in a single day. But we, yeah, we yeah. do. We do substantial shifts in beliefs, behaviors, and that relationship. I have people that start out the workshop. They'll, they say, I'll do anything, but just keep that X, Y, Z enemy from me. By the, end of the, <laughs> by the end of the second day, I've got them hugging. I'm able, that's yeah. our process power is we're able to absolutely neutralize conflict to a point where they'll reset and start again. 
Mm. I love so much about that whole process, you know, particularly the like setting up the environment that it's psychologically safe and and a neutral place where people can then give the positive feedback or give give any feedback really, but honest and um, constructive feedback. And also I love the idea of the whole towards focus of a goal. So not we'll get rid of this, we'll get rid mm. of that, or we'll stop go, or we'll avoid this this thing happening, but looking at, well, what do we want? What, how do we want it to look? And then the visualization and coming back to taking that into specific actions. It's filling the reticular activation system with what you want more of versus what you want less of. Mm. And so that, that, that unleashes more performance, more collaboration and communication because there's, a, there's an allied an aligned viewpoint of what we want in our hopes and dreams and goals and meaningfulness. And so we can then work together and, and collaborate with that process. So it's, it's a one, we do a one or two or three day process, but it's like your vehicle, you have to service, you have to maintain, you have to get back every now and again and just realign, reduce the static stuff happens. People make promises, they break their word. It's, we just haven't been taught at school how to handle conflict in a positive, constructive manner. And it's got to be part of the process because part of being a high-performance team, there's going to be bumps and knocks and missing the ball and missing the goal or doing a bad pass or doing something. But it's about moving on and improving and re-cohesing into that team. You know, when you're on the field in that time, like in business, you've got to bring the best game. Halfway through, you can't stop and start blaming and naming and shaming. You can, yeah. but if there's a consequence of smashing performance yeah. by doing that. And that's what leaders and managers are missing today is they need to become coaches and not the manager that's doing a performance beration on, on the process. I, I, my own experience, I've smashed two relationships because I got berated like a little kid. You shouldn't, you won't, you don't. It's like, whoa, stop. I'm an adult. I don't need that kind of, um, yeah. that kind of behavior. Ask me nicely. I'll do. I'll go to the ends of the earth for you. Blame, name, and shame, and I, I'm off your team in a moment. And and we, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's it's right. We had to we we're here to co-create a better world together as times get tougher in the fourth industrial revolution. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a really important point. I think. I mean, I I kind of left the corporate world many years ago, and I thought that that kind of behaviour was um, was waning and going out of fashion then but i think it's still around so there's probably still a dichotomy of different styles and and that style is still there and like you say people are adults so <laughs> you know i think the challenge that we have with the machine in corporates is there's shareholders there's stakeholders the shareholders still have a huge amount of power we're slowly moving to stakeholder consciousness but the machine is so big it's like those tankers they know they're going to crash 30 kilometers before they hit the the rocks or whatever, it's because it takes, takes so long to slow down that momentum. Yeah, and the turn it, yeah. People that are in power have the old mindset. They have the dino, dinosaur control, command, conquer kind of mindset. Now, I've been into places where the bosses throw stuff and scream and shout. It's like, um, do you realize what you're doing to your, your productivity? And the problem is because he runs the part of the business that makes money, they won't stop him. Hmm. He's seen as the blue-eyed boy because he makes the money. The fact that he happens to be a slave driver, emotionally and verbally whipping the people, don't care. And mm. it's toxic. It can be very, very toxic. Yeah, that's that's really bad. So I think looking at the the processes that you've described to us in terms of high-performance team, I think that's um, really the way to go. And also you talk a lot about um, the human aspect of it and heart-centered leadership as well. So I think that's that's the complete opposite of what you've um, just described there. You know, for me, as I've grown up and got a bit more mature, I've grown from money, money, money. I used to have all my goals on the wall. You know, they were all numbers. Make a million, make this, have a car, have a boat. They were all means goals. They weren't ends goals. So the means goals is the money. I want more money. But the ends goals is I want to feel better. I want to feel safe, secure, respected or certain. And I've hmm. matured into understanding I can get my ends goals without having to go through the means goals. And so very often to make more, we have a win-lose kind of relationship in a business is buy your, buy your staff as cheaply as possible, 
push them as hard as possible to deliver more with less and make as much and keep as much as possible for self. And I just, maybe it's just my age, it's like wine that, that gets better. For me, it's, a, it's about bringing people up. Business is now a tool for me to grow people, to leave a legacy, to build a better lifestyle for those that are around me. Versus, you know, I, I look at these guys in the States and the, the billionaires. I heard that the, the one presidential candidate made an extra 15 billion last year. You know, you, you can't eat that. Yeah. It's like, play the game, but then take the people around you that are helping you make that, embrace them and lift up their life and their family because that it ripples out into the world. And I think we're going to eventually get to a point of consciousness where business will be a system to create a great quality of life for, for, for the planet versus a few shareholders raking in billions and the staff having heart attacks. I was doing some work with a, a local chocolate company and the international director was on the stage presenting and he was slagging them off because they didn't meet their targets and they were installing a new software system that have to work through through Christmas. But it wasn't, guys, let's do this together. It was you effing Oaks did this and you didn't achieve this and you didn't do that because obviously he's got up above him. It's shut. And shouting and holding mm. accountable. And I just thought, I went home and I wrote the, the article somewhere on my website. Slavery is still alive and well. They fed them with lots of, I mean, there was 100,000 rands of the chocolate outside and food and drink. But inside there, he was slagging them off so badly. And I thought, sure, but you've got this beautiful Ferrari and you're taking a 16-pound hammer and you're smashing it. There's, you're not building cohesion. You're not building respect, pride, trust, recognition, collaboration, or anything. It is building fear and not good enough. And I, it's, it's sad, but there's still one or two of them around, and, and they, they smash the machine because they push hard and hard and hard until the machine breaks and people have heart attacks. Mm. And, and we can see it in my segments. I, I would, I, in a yeah, and that just, re, that just reinforces all the baggage that we were talking about earlier, right? So it just makes it really hard to for individuals to let go of the baggage and perform at their best. So it's actually counterproductive. And that's why I'm now people first, planet and profit, because it's it's for the people. If we don't have a planet, you know, life yeah, rafts, life rafts yeah. do not have life rafts. Remember yeah. this, a life raft, if you pop it and you're in the ocean, you're in trouble. And, the, and our little blue bubble is the same. We know we're smashing, we're, we're using resources in an unprecedented rate. So it's people, planet and profit. But profit is the tool in the process for building the people and the planet. It can't be the sole and only reason. Another 10 zeros in the bank is not going to change your, your life. Mm. But no oxygen, no water, no fish, no food, no electricity like now is mm. going to change your life. So that's people. Yeah, yeah. All, all we have to do is look at what's happening with the coronavirus now and, and we see that, right? Hmm. All right. Well, I think that's a really good point to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. Now, I've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today. So what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? For me, we have so much noise in our head that we can't hear that little bit, that little whisper. And so we need to get away from the noise. We need to get to a point where we can slow down the pressure, that internal voice from, from our own individual standpoint and just go and maybe meditate and vegetate and ruminate and, and get outside and look and, and allow some kind of silence in a calm, easy space to happen. Because you can, we're all plugged into a much bigger source. We're just not all listening to the message <laughs> yeah. of the biggest source. So for me, step one is get yourself into that kind of space on, on a regular basis. Just get out there and, and start to just just not think, you know, but it, it's just, just chill. Number two is if you're going to get people together, the context has to be safe, psychologically safe, emotionally safe. And the people also have to believe that they can add value. If you bring the gardener in or the, the cleaner in and they have this constrained, limited mindset, 
they're not going to step forward and be co- courageous or confident enough to share. But if you create a safe space and, and involve them and, and play and have a fun environment where it doesn't matter what you put out, because, you know, there are stories about people that, are, can I tell a story about the helicopter? Yeah, one? yeah, yeah. I like uh, that one. General Electric had their boffins, all their big engineers upstairs in, in the tower because they had a problem with the snow on the lines. When the snow got on the lines, it would get heavy and snap the lines and break the service. So the engineers were thinking, well, we can we can shape the, the rubber, we can put vibrators, we can heat them. And they all had cost constraints and engineering constraints. And so the story goes that the post guy from downstairs in the basement was delivering some post. And he saw the problem in the wall of the snow on the lines. And he nonchalantly said, well, why don't you fly over, over with a helicopter? And they said to him, like, who the heck are you? You're the postman. Get out of here. But, you know, they now use Bell long-range helicopters to clear yeah. the lines. And I love that because, you know, innovation has to come from a new viewpoint. We get so locked into the lines of how we see. The ability to come in from the side or the top or the bottom through a different window allows you to see possibilities that are right in front of you. It's, it's that reticular activation system. The 10 mm-hmm. things that you're seeing out of the 2 billion, somebody else is seeing a different 10. And when they put it on the table, it's like, wow, I didn't even think of that. And mm-hmm. so for me, that's why you've got to bring everybody in and create a safe, fun, inclusive space that everybody can just put something on the table because you never know, you know from their viewpoint and from their window. What, what could happen. And, and we've seen amazing stuff happen from that point of view. So for me, yeah, that, yeah. And, and it's to create a culture of what do you think? What about how, what could we do? You know, have a look around. If we did this and we did this, what could we create in the process? So it, you can inculcate a, a, like we do one times one and two times two and three times three at school. You can do that for creating creativity and innovation in a workplace. And like, what about, what about, what about, how about? Mm-hmm. When I used to have my stepchildren, I've never had kids. So my, all my relationships have had stepkids. And even with the youngsters, I used to start their brain of we're, we're out in the world. Where's the opportunity? How do we do this? What could, what could you do with this? And so it's a thinking style that you can embed into your organization and make it a safe, positive space. But you also need to so you celebrate the crashes and burns as well as you know, the failures, as well as the successes. Mm-hmm. Because if you're too scared to crash and burn, you're not going to step out into the, into yeah, the front. Uh, that's right. and, and, and I think the safety part is a really important thing there to have people feel as though they can contribute ideas and not be shut down um, as as the example by GE sort of suggests that you know might have happened, but looks like uh, it was actually adopted in that case. So there's there's great examples like that. Yeah. All right. Now, um, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? I think for me, I'm exposed to the internet such a lot that I I'm con- and because my brain is an optimization system, I'm constantly scanning for what's good, what's amazing, what's different from me in in a near viewpoint. But I'm also looking in the longer term pictures of like technology with artificial intelligence. You know, so we when we like the coronavirus, now we have constraints. You, you, can't, you can't do team building in the kind of context that we have with this corona situation. So what's going to happen with that? So for me, I'm constantly in a mode of improve, grow, build, learn, add, adjust. And I think for me, the web has been the best thing that I get online. I'll go and look on YouTube and I'll look at amazing new innovations. Now, we, we have access to mm. the, the web is the brain of, and I want to use a little G, little God. The, the internet is humanity's consciousness. Now, even from the days of, of the brazier or, or the, the airplanes, when one person gets an idea, a, a, an innovation, a, a spark of genius, very likely another person or two or three are getting it at the same time because it's now been put into the grid. The moment somebody thinks of something, goes into this, grid, this consciousness grid, and you can get access to it. So for me, it's a constant exposure to possibility and, and looking, wow, that's amazing. How do I take that and use that? So I'll see a game that somebody's got, and I'll think, Hell, if I took a part of that and I took a part of this and put it together into a new recipe, and I've I've done it. I've I've created um, these little cards, 
these kindness and compliments cards. I saw a, a process that somebody had, and I thought, wow, why can't I just do that with coaching and use it in, in four different areas for the team performance? And it's been an absolute amazing thing. So it's, for me, it's a mindset. I'm constantly harvesting mm. innovation, but I'm looking at the far corners of what's the most crazy yeah, yeah. stuff people are doing right now? <laughs> yeah, and the internet is is fabulous for that, isn't it? I mean, we live in such a wonderful time in, in that sense of, of being able to access that kind of information at, at just the tap of a mouse button. And it's new information. It's like yesterday, today kind of yeah. stuff, not 50 years old stuff. Yeah, so that's right. That's yeah. my journey. Yeah, all right. Well, do you have a favorite resource that you use a lot other than the internet? <laughs> I think all of my stuff is looking at what people are doing and how do I improve it? How do I make it, how do I 10 exit, not just improve it by a percent or two. It's getting exposed to, I watch what other people do in their processes. I watch my, what my competitors are doing and I think, okay, what's the thinking behind that? How do I take, because I find a component of it and I think I like that component. I don't like that part of the thing, but I love that part of the process. What, what can I add it to that I've already got? Or what do I need to create that I can add it to? So I have a game called Stacker. You, you see the kids do the, the racing. They've got five cups and four, three, two, one cups. And mm. it's a speed game, you know, stack up, stack down, stack up, stack down. And so I thought, wow, there's an optimization process. So I've taken that and I create people in teams of six. And you have to build the thing up and down. But there are certain rules. You have to touch two cups. You, you can't do it in a certain process. You've got to uh, follow a routine. And so it's, it's a process of teaching them how do we optimize? What do we improve? What's important in communication and allocation of resources, of, of focus of work? Who's doing what where? How do we? And so it becomes an optimization game, which can be, a 20, 30 minute game or it's a whole day process where people go from 30, 40, 50 seconds when they first do it, a current record is 11 seconds. Now, because we say to them, right, do do baseline tests, 40 seconds. And then I say, your goal is to beat 10, 12 seconds. It's like, no, never impossible. I say, <laughs> impossible. Let's break the barrier of possibility. Now that the four minute mile, it is possible. Now go for it. And the energy that is unleashed as the team's improve and come down and then each round is so what did you learn we need to communicate we need to my output is your input my quality of my work controls the quality of your input and output so it becomes a consciousness building process in a fun context that we then use and then apply it and relate it back so what could you do back in the workplace now they start to think well i, I could do this i could make sure that this i could improve this and so that mm. becomes the, listen, pride, trust, and recognition are the containers of happiness at work. When last yeah. we're people told, I respect you, I appreciate you, I value, uh, I really, you know, those things, when were you proud of where you worked and what you did and how you did it? So building those in, humans are simple souls. They're not, rock, it's not rocket <laughs> science to get yeah. the best out of a person. But you do have to know how to have that sensitivity. And you need to care, which is why for me mm. it's people first, planet and profit, because the world's been driven by the profit, profit, profit. Um, but it, it has to change. We have to innovate ourselves for humanity. On on that one, so you know, you, you gave us a great example there of the game and how how that can how people then take that as a metaphor for processes that they're doing inside the workplace. What's the best way then to kind of keep them on track once they start to implement uh, one of these activities, one of these improvement activities? For me, the keeping on track is setting up regular times when you get together where there's feedback in a coaching context. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? What's in the way? What do you need help with? And uh, you know, I have my little sand timer, you know, my – these sand timers, you get the egg timers, the 10 minutes and the 20 minutes. It's a process from my book, Swift Success, that I call Fierce Focus. And it's about taking absolute, fiercely focused, nothing else matters, either in the work that you are doing to generate the value in the work, or sitting with somebody and saying, right, 
but it has to come away from being, I'm your boss, you are my slave, and watch out in case you make a mistake. It's got to be a peer kind of context to say, listen, Jürgen, you, you said you're going to get 10 down today. How, how's it going? Uh, what do you need? What are the constraints? What, how do we improve it? How's it going for you? But caring enough to come from the human element that you care about the person. Yes, work's got to get done. But you care about the person. Understanding that you give them control and them power with you as the manager to help them be the best version of themselves. Versus con you, can, you can't push wet string uphill. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a problem. And the yeah. moment you take away the person's self-drive and motivation and inspiration, you're then constantly on their back micromanaging them. But if you can step back and, and show, listen, I believe you can do it. It's been done before. Because that's also something. Somebody comes and says, you need to do 100 units. It's like, has it ever been done before? No, the best is 12, but you need to go for 100. It's like, really? You know, right away, they're, they're like, no, not going to do it. So goals yeah. need to be reasonably stretched. But the person doing it has to have the belief system of the possibility that it exists. And that's why Roger Bannister's coach was the first guy to run the four-minute mile in his head because he believed it was possible and created the context for Rand, for Roger to use his fullest potential. But it was that fierce focus, creating the belief, and then the positive support in the process. You know, these once a year uh, performance assessments are crazy. Mm. Like you're telling a person you've been off track for 345 days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you know, right. It's, 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 it's a daily check-in, how are you doing, what's mm. happening, what do you need my help with, and maybe a weekly, like, a bit more formal process of, okay, so like, how's it going? What's happening? Mm. What, are you, what are you most proud of? Where do you need help? Yeah, I like the uh, fierce focus and, and very timely feedback. And I think, um, you know, the, the old annual performance appraisal days, I used to um, think that was nonsense way back 20 years ago, but uh, seems it's still around. And both but sides yeah, hate it. Both sides hate this performance thing. Yeah, yeah. Stressful. It's not inspiring, mm. motivating, or engaging at all. Yeah. All right. So fierce focus and timely feedback. Coach approach. Getting, yeah, coaching approach. Right. Yeah. All right. Now, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? In the digital world, you better be a digital gladiator. I'm just <laughs> realizing even more right now with the coronavirus, um, I'm stepping up my fo my first focus on executive coaching and leadership coaching because I can do that remotely. And so I'm thinking, so for me to get that part of my business going, what is necessary? And absolutely 20 out of 20, it's online, understanding how to get yourself in front of your ideal client. It's being presented professionally, how you position, package, and promote yourself. But it's the visibility. I can have the best packaging, the best presentation. If nobody can find me online, I don't care how good you are. You're not going to get the business. I often mm. use the term, you can be the best night, lady of the night. But if you're in the corner, nobody sees you, you're not going to have any business. So number one, it's, it's the visibility that you have to find ways to use the different social media platforms. Uh, I just got accredited now for LinkedIn to do video streaming on LinkedIn, which is very nice. So, and these are free. You can go live on Facebook free on YouTube. Yeah. These are not 100 million rand or 100 million dollar platforms that you've got to spend and have stuff. Pick up a phone, pick up a thing, internet connection, you, you're global. So yeah. visibility number one, credibility number two. We are now, my competition used to be the people in my village and then in my town and then in the city and then in the country. My competition is now on the planet. Yeah. So the, the bar has been raised so much higher and it's, we, we can see if the emperor has got no clothes. Yeah, that's right. The other side of that equation, though, is that the, your, um, your clients used to be in your neighborhood and in your village and in your city and in your country, and now they're global as well. And that's, and that's why, because the competition is so fierce now, your credibility has to be good, but your capacity and capability have to be world-class. That mm. when you do get called on and you step up, you're impressive because then the word-of-mouth component starts to help you. If you're a speaker 
a lot of your business is going to come from being at a speaking event where other people will see you, hear you, and come and book you or refer you. You're going to get more business by being on that field and performing professionally than being at home trying to get your little website going. So good and well getting that techie component of the process, but learning how to market, learning how to sell, and then when you do deliver, over-deliver to a point where you are wow. Mm. Because it's like a restaurant. You're only as good as your last meal. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. So, yeah. So be a digital gladiator and get your visibility really up and then deliver. That's over-deliver. Over-deliver, great. All right. Thanks, Tony. This has been really fabulous. Now, where can people find out more about you and perhaps even um, sign up for your book or buy your book and um, even reach out and say thank you for what you've shared with us today? I'm happy to give all of your listeners a free copy of my Swift Success, a PDF version. But you can find me on lifemasters.co.za. So I'm South Africa, lifemasters.coza or tonydovalespeaks.com. It's the D-O-V-A-L-E, Tony DeVale. You'll find me at just a search on Google. I'm here to raise humanity's consciousness. So whatever material that I can have that can help you start, grow, be the best version of yourself and unleash your fullest potential, I'm happy to share them with your team because when, when the world grows, we all benefit from the process. When the water in the harbor rises, all, all boats all rise. All ships, yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, lovely. Thanks for that. That's very generous to offer the book and uh, electronic version, obviously, and um, we'll post links to that in the show notes as well. And I'm happy to give away a free high-performance assessment, a, a, a shortened version of my, high, my revolutionary workplace high-performance assessment. They can send me an email from my site, and I'm happy to, to give them a free one. They must just mention that they heard it from Jürgen and Innova uh, Biz, and I'll gladly give them a, a, a demo session of that. Fabulous. All right. Well, that's very generous, Tony. Thanks for that. Now, is there a one piece of advice you'd like to leave our listeners today before we wrap this up, um, particularly in terms of wanting to be a leader in innovation and in, in their field? For me, my entire life's wisdom comes down to, as a leader, your job, role, function, and responsibility is to get the right people into the right machine and then unleash their fullest potential. As a leader, you're herding cats in the dark on crap. You have to get the right people on your bus, give them the tools that are needed, and then set them free. Unleash them with passion and possibility to utilize their full potential. You, as a leader, you create the context of how they show up and the direction of the of the boat, of the steamer that you're going. But you have to be the one that brings that energy and creates the possibility when I can 10x and that when I wake up in the morning, it's not good morning, God. It's, you know, it's like I'm here. I'm excited to go to work. I'm look. most people are not happy to go to work. It's like, oh, my yeah, God, yeah. it's Monday. As a leader, Gallup's research shows leaders aren't leading effectively. Yes, you're making money, but you're not leading your people. You're not unleashing the heart and soul of your people. And so for mm. me, that thing is get a team, give them the tools, do the team building. You service your car, you service your computers, service your team, maintain, yeah. service them, use a framework, a proven framework like our revolutionary workplace, and set them free to run. Mm. Yeah, that's a great call to action, and I certainly endorse that um, and allow them to reach their full potential. I think that um, when you see that happening, you do get amazing or you see amazing results and amazing transformations. Well, then you get the person to bring their whole head, heart, and soul to the deal. They don't yeah. leave their brains at the, in, the, in the parking lot. You know, it's, <laughs> they come and they go the extra mile and they bring their full mm. potential. And then they collaborate. And they, yeah. And they enjoy coming to work. Love coming mm. to work. Mm. And they're proud of what they do. All right. Well, thanks, Tony. Now, finally, who would you like me to chat with on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? I think my apprentice, a guy, Honest and Kube. And he's a black dude in South Africa, a Zimbabwean that's come down here. 
I've been with him for eight years. He is a profoundly amazing human being from the point of view of being a student of learning, of integrity and commitment and passion for his people and uplifting his people, and a growth path. Everybody has potential and opportunity. He has taken every single moment and put it and squeezed it into the can. And I, as much as I used to be the master and he was the student, you know, the, mm. the, the, the student, there are times when we're presenting together or he's speaking and I look at him and I think, Mr. DeVale, you better up your game because your student is coming past you. And so he's, he's a good soul. He has a, a different viewpoint into the window of, of the world from a, from a, bl a black male point of view. Um, and we, we have incredible conversations. But he, he has come through tough times. And he's, he's, he's like this bubble of light that is starting to create a, a good role model for the people around him. And he, you know, he works in the community. He works in the restaurant. He works with me. And he's a guy, he's not driven by the money. He's driven by the impact on people. And for me, the more people we have like that, you know, we have such a huge, like 70% unemployment in our youth. And if we're going to change Africa, we need more people with his, his mm -hmm. attitude, his mindset, and the capacity to take information and apply it and, and action that. Well, great. Um, so we'll get an introduction from you to Honiston and uh, look forward to having a chat with him as well. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today, Tony. This has been wonderful. You've uh, shared a lot of insights into how you go about doing the team building and changing people's mindsets and allowing them to let go of their baggage and and move forward and realize their full potential. So I really appreciate that. And I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interesting and thought provoking conversation with Tony and took something away from his episode. One of my takeaways was to ensure that the culture of my business is such that it is safe to be curious, to try things out and to learn from failure. In any case, I don't think there's any such thing as failure. It's all just feedback. I'd love to know what you took away from Tony's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Tony DeVale. That is T-O-N-Y-D-O-V-A-L-E. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Tony DeVale. Now there you'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Tony and links to his Life Masters website, his books, his social media pages and the other resources that we spoke about in today's conversation. Tony suggested that we have a conversation with Honiston Kubay of H-Talk on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So Honiston, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast courtesy of Tony DeVale. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. But most importantly, it will enable you in less than 30 minutes to gain absolute clarity about who your ideal client is and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into marketing mastery or our help with producing your very own podcast, even launching your very own podcast if you don't yet have one, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we can set up a quick call to have a short conversation and find out whether we're a good fit for one another. Tune in again to the next episodes of the InnovaBuzz podcast where we've got even more fantastic guests lined up, including David Breyer, brand strategist, and Sarah Kay of K by Design. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the InnovaBuzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe. 
www.innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have. So go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. Innovaviz.